All right, we are ready to go this morning. Welcome to Voyage Church. Those of you who are watching online, some of you are doing that as well. And so we want to uh, just say good afternoon, good evening, good night, whenever it is you're watching uh, the service, since it's recorded and put online later today. Um, God bless all of you out there. Thanks for being here in person as well this morning. We're delighted to have uh, Troy Evans from the Edge Church this morning, and he's going to share a message here that God has laid upon his heart to share. Um, and I uh, want to just mention a couple things before we get moving into our time of worship. Number one, it's that time of year when we collect uh, some things for our shoebox ministry called Samaritan's Purse. Most of you are familiar with that. We've been doing it for years, and we've got two weeks to put these together. The delivery date is November the 23rd. Um, you can go online to Samaritan's Purse directly. You can print off everything you need there at home. We're not going to provide you with a whole lot of things. Most of us buy our own shoe boxes or boxes that we put the things in, and you can go there for all your directions. We'll show you a short video next week, so stay tuned for that. But for now, just go to Samaritan's Purse and check out their shoebox ministry if you're interested in doing that. You can put together a box for a boy or a girl, and you can bless kids all around the world. I also want to mention um, one thing. We are reading this book right now. It's called How to Pray, and some of you are reading it. There's about six or seven of us who are part of this book club right now, and we're about halfway through. Uh, but there's another book that we're going to start reading after this, the beginning of the year. It's a book called Jesus and the Disinherited, and it's a book that goes back several years, back to 1949. It's by Howard Thurman, who was a spiritual advisor back in the day to Martin Luther uh, King and also the first black dean at a white university, Boston University. So this is an old classic in the world of theology, and it's a short book, and I think it's going to be an engaging read for all of us. So I want to just encourage you to think about that. Again, that'll be in the beginning of the year, in January. Jesus and the Disinherited. It's a book that was published back in 1949, so it's a bit old, but it's a classic. You can find a copy at Amazon. Maybe Shane can get you a copy. So um, since Shane works at Amazon, right? Um, I'm, sure they, I'm sure he can go grab a copy for us. Um, so that's, that's going on. So I want to just encourage you to do that when you get a chance to think about that. Those are, I mean, I, I know not everyone here is a reader, and, and I get that. But I just want to encourage you to maybe reach out, stretch out beyond your normal comfort zone and read something maybe totally different like that. All right, with that said, let's move into worship this morning. We're going to pray, and uh, let's open with this word of prayer to the God who is watching over us, who is guiding us, who is here in our midst. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you so much for the sunshine that we get to enjoy on this November day. What a joy it is to have beautiful weather in November. We celebrate that here this morning. Father God, we also just celebrate the chance that we can come together for this hour and focus our time and our attention upon you. So God, we walk in here with, I'm sure, some things that are things we're carrying around. And so, God, let us just lay those burdens at your feet this morning as we come and direct our focus upon you through these amazing songs of worship, through your word proclaimed. We pray all this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. It is good to see you today. It's good to be here. It's good to see sunshine and warm weather this time of year. Usually, maybe we get a day of this, but we've had it pretty good here in the last few days. Uh, praise. Do we, how do we praise God? What, what is the status quo when we come to church? Um, just in all of my years of uh, being in church, we, we come and we just sit. And we don't really embrace true praise, in my opinion. And I'm kind of a cheerleader up here. I mean, sometimes we have a, a set where we're really focusing on that. And um, sometimes it's something else. Maybe it's something more inward. But today, we are going to focus on praise. Um, I don't know. The Word of God kind of gives us, lays it out there for us. We don't praise like relaxing in our chairs and with our hands together or folded. We get a little bit energetic about it. And uh, in re do all due respect to the COVID situation, we don't want to get too riled up here, but um, Psalm 150 says this about all of that. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary, like here. 
Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. That's not really a quiet instrument, is it? Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with the timbrel and dancing. You don't have to dance today, but you know, that would be appropriate. Yeah. Praise him with the strings and pipe. We don't have one of those, sorry. Praise him with a clash of cymbals. Man, we need cymbals, right? Clash of cymbals, but that's too loud. Praise him with, re with resounding cymbals. God wants us to get excited about who he is, and we can't be excited when we're just, like, not excited. <laughs> uh, so let everything, everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. It reemphasizes it right there. So... It's a serious thing, not to take it lightly, not to try to hide from it, not to uh, not engage when uh, praise is being done. So um, we're gonna, that's what we're doing right now. Are you okay with that? Okay, let's all stand and sing, all right? Let everything that has breath praise.
Amen? Amen. Oh, hey, hey, you're away. Good. All right. Okay, we're in business. God is so good to us. We open our hearts to him. We can take in more of what he pours out. And what he pours out is much greater than we can measure, that we can even understand. So I challenge you just to open up. Let the Spirit of God bring peace and light and truth and love and mercy to your heart right now. We all need it.
may be seated. We're going to continue our time of worship through prayer right now, so have a seat, and we'd love to hear from you. Um, in Jesus' name we pray all these things. Amen.
Well, good morning, everybody. So when um, PE, as I call them, <laughs> that's sort of what we've known, I've known Troy for 11 years, and holy cow, I had more hair back then. But um, I was taller, too. And, um, you know, you, you go in life, and you have people in your life that will say something to you or will feed into your life and as you reflect back at that, and Roy, Troy is one of those people in my life. And I told him that this morning, and he specifically doesn't remember the time. But back when the Edge was starting uh, at Kentwood, we went down and helped. And I just sort of stuck around down there because it was great. But I remember times that we would just say, hey, let's go grab the grill. And we'd go into the neighborhood, and we'd bring lawnmowers and rakes and shovels and stuff. And we would end up in somebody's front yard who had the slightest idea. I remember one time... I don't know the streets, but a couple streets back behind the edge. We're back there, and a big old guy, Jabbar, who I just love. I mean, this guy was like a linebacker. He was, what, what was he, 350 pounds, and it was just big. I remember we're, we're going in this backyard, and the people didn't know. We just start mowing yard and trimming bushes, and this lady, lady comes out and says, what are you doing? You know, Jabbar looks at her and says, you better get behind me. So, you know. <laughs> And it was so funny, but we would do stuff out of love, and we would be on Division Avenue and sitting in front of church or whatever, and there was the restaurant place, supply place next to us in the parking lot, but a lot of great things. But one day, Troy and I were talking, and I had to be honest that I was one of the white people, they talk about white privilege, that I just thoroughly couldn't wrap my hands around. I was one of the things, well, you know, they're out running the streets, these cats are, just let them go get a job. And just talking to Troy about that, and he said something to me that stuck so well, and that is, Dan, you have to remember lives, majority of these kids didn't have dads in their lives, or moms in their lives, and they may not even know how to mow a yard, or start a mower, or fix a leak, or use a hammer. I remember him saying that, pound a nail. And I'm going, you know what? That, to me, changed my life that day that said, holy cow, there's a privilege I had that I, my dad died when I was 17, but until that time of learning how to fix things, learning how to do stuff, learning how to do that type of stuff. And that day on opened my life to the change that um, being able to feed into these young men's lives, sitting down and going through Fast Web. Who knows Fast Web is a college student you go through and look at stuff. Being able to sit down and fill that out or work on stuff that there's no dad around. And that was the challenge he put to me and a challenge that has changed my life to be able to feed into kids of color that what we would consider as a privilege or just being there was not to them. So, so with that, I get the honor of introducing PE, but the real reason that I really wanted them to come today is because I've been wanting one of these shirts. These are so cool. And I, uh, I, they got them here for sale. I've been seeing them on Facebook, and I stopped down by the edge one day, and nobody answered the door. Um, but I wanted one of these shirts, so I get to buy one. So um, you can tell us the sort of history behind this when you come up and do that. But with that, I want to introduce PE, a great friend of mine. I consider a mentor because I sure learned stuff from him and stuff. So, man, you're on. Oh, sweet. Are we breaking the rules, man? I can't help myself. I'm just a hugger. How's everybody doing? Everybody good? Okay, let me go up here. Oh, man. I am, oh, whoa, break. bust my neck. It looks like that's deceiving. Who's the facility guy around here? We gotta, we gotta have some talks, bro. Like, this is not right. <laughs> is this a chair? Is this a, uh, it is? Okay, cool. Uh, I, it's not a chair, though. I'm not gonna sit up. <laughs> We're gonna take this. Oh, man, I am, uh, oh, man, we, uh, thank you so much for ha having me come out and uh, everybody say hi to Jade. You'll get a chance to meet Jade later. Um, we, uh, uh, I get a chance to pastor a church called The Edge here in Grand Rapids. Um, I don't know, um, Dan, Dan probably gave the best picture of, of what it is that we're about. Um, we minister to a group of youth and young adults. Um, that's just, just wild. You feel me? Like, it's just, it's a wild group, um, in, in, in the hood, you know? Um, but don't get it twisted. 
A church is multi-ethnic, multi-generational, multi-everything. You is we're a mixed bag of peanuts. You feel me? I, I like to crack jokes, so even if they're not funny, you can laugh. You know that. Like, so the dude back there just put laugh behind me, so then at least I feel better about myself. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm feeling discouraged right now about my comedy career. So um, we, we get a chance to do that, and we use hip hop as a medium. So if you can imagine, the worship is, is, is like 95% hip hop. And so I'm like, ooh, why would you ever do that? Isn't that sinful? Do the history of our hymns. You might find out that they're um, the restructuring of pub tunes. All right. uh, I use pub because she's from England. And so it's like, I like to say pub just to say like, I'm, I'm relating, you know. But like, that's what it is. And so we said, actually, we've been for centuries, we've been going over to other countries and doing what's called contextualization of the gospel. Meaning there is a way to speak to people, to communicate to people in their context. And then we choose, you know, you know what we do. We, we go to Mexico, we go to Africa. We start to understand the culture. We start, I've been to several countries. I'm telling you, we, we start to understand. We, we want to understand. So we want to communicate so that people actually understand it. Oh. <laughs> So, just because we don't like it, or we don't understand it, doesn't mean that the church doesn't need to invade it. In fact, um, we're talking about marginalized people groups. Um, uh, I used to work for the, the Western denomination responsible for urban church planning for North America. I spent the last two and a half years in England um, doing the exact same thing for the Western denomination. <sighs> You get what I'm I can't help myself. No! You're not the boss of me, sir. No. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> I can do nothing. Oh, um, man. What was I talking about? The chair is distracting. <laughs> what? Yeah, in England, those people. Up, oh, Man, I appreciate it, man. Jay, I need one of these. <laughs> oh, this is amazing. <laughs> Pick up this boring piece of life. Um, and um, what we learned is, is contextualization is so important. I, 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 land, I find myself landing in countries and states and cities that I know nothing about, and they're expecting me to make social organizational an organizational shift and change. You learn how to humble yourself real quick, and you better learn the language. You better learn the, the culture. You better be willing to, to say that you're, you're not as smart as a fifth grader. You, you get what I'm saying? If you're going to be effective. And uh, God has allowed me to do that, and I, I really, really appreciate it. And these young cats, man, like, whew, I can just talk about them all day. I'm so proud of them, you know? It's like, but it's like herding, like, 100 cats at the same time. And I try to give instructions. Do cats actually listen? Uh, like, <laughs> That's rhetorical, right? Like, like you know what I'm saying? Like, uh, it's, it's like that, and, and, um, but by God's grace, as, as Dan has said, he, he's one of the guys that come down and, uh, and, and, and wasn't like, yo, I'm here to, 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 to be a blessing to you, uh, poor black kids. I'm, I'm here to be a part of community. And then I have a certain set of skills, a certain set of, of, of abilities uh, how can I be a blessing and humble themselves so many times um, to, to, to do that? And I, I really, over the years, just really, really appreciate that. I've always come, and he would act dumb too. Like, stuff he already knew, he would ask me. You know what I mean? Like, he's, like, he's a smart man, and, and God has given him, but the willingness to say, like, no, 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 let, let, me, let me be a learner. Come on. If you got a couple of grades, we're not good at that. We don't know how to shut up, flat out. That's why we're ineffective with young people. Barna, um, well, 51% of, of our 17-year-olds are, are leaving the church. There's a reason for that, because we don't shut our mouths. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm Troy. I love you. Give you a hug. Because <laughs> we think we know everything, and we can't humble ourselves. Even when we do know something, act like you don't sometimes. You feel me? It's effective. We have an army of young people, and people always ask me, I don't leave the church. I'm gone between 15 and 18 days out of the month, somewhere in the world, teaching somewhere. I don't, I don't leave the church. Her age leads to church, period. 
We tell people, like Dan, and people that come and say, like, yo, if you're not willing to allow a teenager to be your boss, you don't want to serve here. And I'm not exaggerating. 16-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 13-year-olds will have keys to the church. Why? Because I'm not smarter than them. And actually, they're more effective than I could ever be. Um, so we, we do a lot of weird stuff. Um, one of them, we start, we, we, we do um, a, um, you know, 50% of kids in Grand Rapids don't graduate from high school. I'm sorry, I love missions, I do. That, that's what I do. I'm in other countries. But don't misunderstand, according to the National, uh, the, the National Baptist um, Convention, that America is the third largest mission field in the world. These are, these are facts. The third, like, why? Because we leave our own backyard to go elsewhere and we don't give a jack about our own communities. Our time, talent, and treasure is not, has not for the last three decades been spent here, majority, to invest in the communities that's right next to us. I'm here today to talk about some pretty touchy stuff. I was sitting back there debating on which one I want to talk about, but it seems like everything I talk about is pretty tough stuff, so I can just kind of close my eyes and pick one, you know? Um, election, yesterday, right? And, ah, man, Americans, man, Americans are weird. So you, you know what just happened when I said election? Everybody like, oh no, I don't know what to do with my hands. I don't know what to do with my hands. Like, no, let's talk about the big fat elephant in the room, pun intended. Elephant. Come on, man, I'm a rapper. You know what I'm saying? Keep up. <laughs> Yeah, it's an election. What is the gloom and doom about? Jesus is still on the throne, and this is not some t-shirt garbage. I'm so sick and tired. I'm getting all out of my message. I'm so sick and tired of us making a political party our Jesus. All these classes are sinful. All them dudes are sinful. Fallible. With error. No political party is aligned with the gospel. None of them equally are not synonymous with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what's your problem? Like, oh no, the Lord, like, I don't know what's going to happen now. Like, no, you know what? Jesus is still boss out here. <laughs> That's what's going to happen. I don't like that dude. I don't like that cat, for sure. But Jesus is still King, I am disappointed. Right? Well, by the way, I didn't vote for, I, I, don't, I don't like neither one of them. And I didn't like Obama either. <laughs> so so I, I'm just speaking freely out here. <sighs> Come on, y'all. We've got to be more mature than that. The world is watching. And we're failing. Our kids are watching. And we're failing. We're failing. So I think I just decided what I'm going to talk about. Cool. I was going to talk about racism. Because um, racism is real. It exists, whether you like it or not. And just because racism exists, that doesn't make you a racist. So why are we so scared to talk about it? Why do we get so offended when someone says that racism exists unless, you've been a, unless you're black? <laughs> or you're, unless I'm white? and I can speak for on your behalf as a black man, I can't do that. So stop trying to speak, speak for me. Because you're not a racist. It's that simple. So I'm not gonna talk about racism. Yeah. That's simple. Don't be stuck on stupid. Love people. Don't be stuck on stupid. Love people. Okay? We're going to talk about today a topic. Yeah, we're going to do this one. Woo! Lord, thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus' name. If you had to give one word, you can yell it out. Just one word. Not a sermon. Just one word that would best describe 2020. What would it be? Let's go. What? 
chaos. Fear. 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 What, what was it? Who's that? That's like 19 words. <laughs> okay, drunk first, drunk. <laughs> What's your name, sir? Uh, sorry? Okay. Do you sit right here? That's why. You got to go back there, man. You're a hackler and you, you're in the front row. Okay, that's right. I'm going to keep on picking on you then, bro. What else? Whoa. Whoa. Change. Crazy loco. And one more. What's that? Confusion. I, um, I wrote down a, a, a few um, and, um, of my words that, that come out. Um, refreshing. I got some weird ones, okay? <sighs> refreshing. Um, I, um, after 23 years of, of uh, doing urban ministry, um, by God's grace, because I suck, he's awesome, and I know it, um, he, uh, he allowed me to personally pastor and plant four churches in my life. I've, I've, uh, I've helped probably more than 100, 150 churches plant around the world. Um, a lot of stuff has happened, you know, and uh, in all that time, I've never taken a break. And I never stopped ministry in 23 years. And so there's this thing that's come from the educational society that we've adopted as a church, because a lot of it was Christian education, called sabbatical. Teachers would take sabbatical for a period of time, or, or sabbat, or rest for a certain period of time. And that's what I did. Um, I just had a chance to do that in 2020. Um, urban, multi-ethnic. The reason why we only have 17% of churches in, in America that are multi-ethnic because it sucks and it's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, including gangbanging. Including running major corporations. Including running four organizations in two countries. The hardest thing I've ever done. I took a break. Arrested, um, and got more familiar with God, my family, and myself. I said, "Like, yo, I'm not gonna worry about this church stuff for four months." Um, and it was so refreshing. It's prosperous, you know, all the way around. Um, prosperous. My wife um, is; she comes from the philanthropy and fund development world. I'm a former engineer, IT engineer, um, and, and a serial business owner. And uh, so what's going into ministry, um, quite frankly, um, no money. It just doesn't make sense, doesn't register <laughs> uh, at all. Um, so for her to go and, and start doing, um, doing her philanthropy stuff is cool and fun development. But what, what, she was called, what she's called to do is to counsel people but um, she can only go so far without a degree, so she went and got her master's and stuff, and so, she's, so she started her practice this year. And um, so she's doing counseling, and being a black woman, um, and doing what she does is very, very, very rare. Um, so it's, it's, that's been cool, because prosperity is not the finances here, it is she is walking in her purpose. And that's just, I, it, 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 it feeds me to watch her do She's so happy, you know? Um, not, nothing like that. Um, for me, Hustle, Pray, Eat, we've started um, 17 companies in our church that's owned. Most of them are owned by, um, they're a little older now, but young adults. And t our, our youngest business owner that we started, she was nine when she started hers. And uh, we, we just invest a lot of money, time, and uh, help cats start their companies. Hustle, Pray, Eat was one of them. And so literally in a year, it's become a national brand among urban hip hop culture. Um, and so it's, just, it's just, uh, just been crazy because we don't, I'm a former banger. 
and I don't understand um, just wearing something or just saying, just saying I'm a Christian and live like a dog, pretty much like a practical atheist. Where I come from, you die for that. No exaggeration. You don't say that you represent vice lords and you over here represent, I don't, that does, that, so when I became a Christian, I'm like, oh, so all y'all Christian? How can all y'all be Christian? Because you don't look like him. You don't like her. Y'all don't look the same. So for me, if I'm going to wear something, this is what we live. God designed us to work hard and smart at the same time. He wants us to seek him, not our three-minute lame prayers we do, or some of you that spend four hours of lameness. No, seek him consistently. When that girl walked by, you're not looking. Seek him. You're fighting. Going to war with that flesh and eating, which is taking care of ourselves and others, mind, body, and spirit. I'm mean, like, I could get behind that and put a lot of money to do it. To see a young cat now travel literally the world, doing music, taking house to pray, eat with them. So it's been prosperous. But let me leave you with this one. This is what I want to talk about for the next couple of minutes. What time I got to be finished? Oh, sweet. Whenever, don't say that to me. We'll be here tonight. She'll be going to get popcorn and pizza. What's your name, sister? Grace, you'll be going, yeah, she'll be going to get some pizza. We'll be sitting here chilling for the rest of the day. So don't tell me to take your time. Don't, don't, don't say that. That's for you. Okay? For me, the biggest one, those were all, all like, hey, those were great. For me, 2020 has been disappointing. That's what I want to talk about today is disappointment. That's, that, that one comes over in, in the midst of all the good that's been happening. Shoo, can anybody else feel me? It's like what you thought was not. Things are shifting. Things are changing and you can't do nothing about it. Um, for me, in one year I lost both my, my, my father-in-law and my dad. Um, my dad had some complications with COVID, went into the hospital, got out, oh, you're good. Sent home with the breathing machine. Two weeks later, back in the hospital. Two weeks later, he dies. You know, um, and to lose my father-in-law, all, it, was just, it was just too much. Jay lost her dad this year. Um, it's just, just, uh, just too much. I went into 2020 not having a clue of who I was. Um, I suck at 3,217 things. I'm good at a few. Very good. And one of them is strategic planning. That's what I get paid to do in organizations and ministries and people's lives. I'm a consultant. That's what I do. And not to know how to strategically plan my own life. Come on. It's like the barber and his hair all messed up. Because <laughs> you just can't get to it. You can't get around to it. Do you know what that feels like? When you're like, you're good. You're even helping a lot of people do this for their own lives, and their own business, their own ministry. You can't do it. For, I had no clue of who I was. Am I this hip-hop pastor guy? I'm almost 50 years old. I got multiple grandchildren, about nine of them. I got a 31-year-old son. Am I still the hip-hop Pastor, if I'm not that, what am I? Come on, midlife crisis. Walk with me. If I stop doing this, any, come on, don't lie. Anybody else ever felt like if I stop doing this, this, and this, if I stop, when I stop being a mom, my kids leave, what am I? Come on. My kids are about to leave the house. I'm celebrating on one end, and I am confused on the other end. You know? Just disappointed that like, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I want to leave um, us with a few, a few nuggets about how to deal with disappointment. And to my sister that said she was with the, um, going in and doing the cleaning, and uh, the person there, I don't know if they, if they was the, their candidate that won or not. Um, I want to, even if the candidate, did win, that candidate's going to disappoint them. 
So everybody needs to listen as it relates to politics. But in life, um, I want to leave us with a couple, a couple, a couple of nuggets that I, I'm learning and, um, and I'm hoping it makes sense. So disappointment is sadness, displeasure caused by um, non-fulfillment of one's hopes or expectations. Good definition? You work with that? I strongly believe that high hopes, expectations in people, places, and things set us up for failure. Because we put our hopes in people, places, and things, expecting them to come through. We set our hopes too high. I, I can't stand the term, yeah, my wife completes me, or, or, or she, she's, my, she, she's probably the better half. But like all those things, I get, the, I get the sentiment. I understand where you're coming from, but my wife don't complete me. Jesus does. Because the moment that my kids or my wife or anybody else outside of him completes me, my expectations are set way too high. It's only one. Because it's, they're going to fail you. <laughs> And when they do, now you're in crumble. Like, I can't believe that he or she did that. I can't believe it. Yeah, your kids, they suck. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> and tell them I said it. <laughs> They're going to fail you, even the best one. They're going to fail. Um... I got to help everybody. I was going to move on, but I'm not. (sighs) This is going to help your soul, especially you. (laughs) Especially you. Yeah. You ready? You need to be on the edge of your seat for this one. There you go. This is going to be good. I can tell. (laughs) Good. (laughs) That's Dory. I'm sorry. Um. Used cars men sell used cars. Come on. Didn't that help you? Come on. I should send you an invoice for that one. Why do we act like when we buy a used cars that it's never going to break down? Used cars men sell used cars. Someone else used it. You don't know how much they used it, but yet our expectations are set like it's a brand new car with two miles on it. Think about it. What if we come to the table? This is, Jay knows this. When I go to the restaurant, I tip very well. And uh, um, I didn't know there was a term in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the industry, at IHOP at least. My, my, uh, my, one of my peoples worked in IHOP. And uh, what they said is that there's a term called Canadian. Uh, what they call black people that come to, to restaurants because black people don't tip. It's dead. It's a culture. It's like, oh, uh, we got some Canadians, uh, you know. That's some type of ism, isn't it? Right? That's just weird. Just, just a side thought. I forget what I was talking about. Um, but let's go back up here. <laughs> oh, people will disappoint you. <laughs> Even the IHOP people. Used cars, men sells cars. Uh, used cars, we act, act, act as if they don't, they're not selling me a used car. Is that's because we set our expectations way too high on people, places, and things. I think if we start, what I do with, with, um, with waitresses, I say everybody starts at one dollar. And it's up to you whether you go up or you go down. But everybody's going to start at the same place. What if we did that relationally? What if we did that in our situations? The new job is not the last job. Your new relationship is not the last relationship. You, you get what I'm saying? It starts here and has the opportunity to go up or go down. Okay? First point would be people would disappoint you. That didn't seem like it was surprising this joint. Like everybody like, yeah. <laughs> okay, Einstein. <laughs> But help me with this. Well, why are we, we know this, but then why are we so surprised when they do? Why, are we, why do we get so shaken when they do? 
Our culture is, is primed for people to fail because of 2 Timothy 3. It outlines why. It's like, this, you tell me if this is 2020. But mark this, this will be terrible times in the last days. I'm not telling you, you tell me. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient. I'm getting dis- depressed just reading this. Um, to, their, to their parents, um, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, lo- not lovers of good, treacherous, rash, um, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. That is a, a concoction for disappointment. People will fail you because we are morally depraved. And I'm not talking about some definition of depravity. I'm talking about the dictionary. Morally corrupt. Since the fall of man, we've been messed up. People will disappoint you, but not everybody's being malicious when they do disappoint you. Because some of us sitting around, that you, you, you're, you're walking around right now in this room, that you're so disappointed at everybody. But there's one common denominator in that, you. Maybe you're fallible. Maybe you've done something wrong too. We'll get to that in a second. We're prone to disappoint people. If you have not disappointed a person in your life, raise your hand. It's quiet up in this joint, you feel me? <laughs> so we're all on the, on the same playing field that we've all have disappointed people. So why don't we give the same courtesy to others? The president that's in office you know, Trump was in the office. I think it would be so simple for people to say, whether you're Democrat or Republican, just to say, he's going to disappoint me. He's going to say something. He's going to do something. He's going to do policies. His life is going to disappoint me because he's human. He's a used car salesman. Oh, my goodness. It's dangerous making people your savior. Um, people will disappoint you and will be hypocrites in the process. Um, I'll make this really short because I don't have that much time. My dad, um, my dad, who, who I, I talked about earlier in the past, he was my biological father. He was there when I was, uh, he came when I was six weeks old. And, uh, but he, he's, he's my dad, you know, no hesitation about that. My biological father threw me up in the air and walked away. I've seen him about maybe 15 times in my whole life. And I vowed, if you know my history, you know I'm not, I'm not, I'm, this is not some, some TV exaggeration. He, 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 he could have lost his life. That was my, that was my commitment. So one day I'm sitting in the church, pastoring, guess who shows up? My, my biological father. And I, bare minimum, I wanted to break his face or see if he knew how to box. I'm just saying, we family, you know what I'm saying, I'm just confessing, you know what I'm saying, I'm just telling you what it is. I wanted to break his face. I train fighters, that's what I do, my whole family, we fight professionally, that's what we do. And I want to see, can he box? I guess I'm halfway Christian. Because that day, we didn't box. But I did ask, I was like, bro, where were you? And waiting for the answer. This is what he said to me. He said, Troy, I don't know anything else but to run. He said, my whole life, that's all I did was run from conflict. I ran from you and your brother. That's what happened. And I thought about it. You see, I got caught in a grand jury investigation for selling dope to um, the feds or whoever these people were. 
I was leader of this gang called the Vice Lords. Had women on the stroll, prostitutes. I had a boy when I was 16. I ended up going to jail for several times, but ended up going to jail for this one, you know. By the grace of God, dude's got 10 pieces, and, and all, I got two years. And when I got out, I'm like, oh, man, I need to do better. So I, you know, I jet out, end up homeless in North Carolina for another year and a half. Then finally I come back. And I got to do something better because people want to kill me. So I leave and I move to Detroit. Get my life to Christ. Start doing what I do, start starting businesses and stuff like that. And life is good, except for my boy. I didn't do nothing but run. That log, I just log in my eye. But meanwhile, I'm looking at this dude for perfection. I didn't expect him to disappoint me, but yet I'm being a disappointment to my son. Don't be a hypocrite. You're going to disappoint somebody too. Give, that, give the other person across from you the benefit of the doubt. I've been molested as a boy. And again, this is another guy that I needed to kill. Just, I guess that's just a pattern with me. Right? So I get, I get the treacherous, well, you don't know what was done to me. I got the t-shirt, the hat, you name it, I got it. By God's grace, both of the men are still breathing. By God's grace only. Because I messed up too. Your plans will disappoint you. Proverbs 16, 9. In the hearts of human plans their course. It, it plans their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Proverbs 19, 21. Many are the plans of a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. I set off the planet church in Detroit told the edge, like, yo, we're about to plant this church. I'm a, and I, I score high in vision, uh, visionizing capacity. So I, pass, I convince people to go to a desert, tell them they're going to drink while they're there. And they follow me. That's what I do. And I said, yeah, we're going to go drink some water in the desert. There ain't no, wasn't no water. And you have to come back and tell your congregation, like, yeah, I'm sorry. We're going to have to stop doing that, that church plant. A friend of mine started an organization called Failure Lab. Anybody ever heard of it? It's like TED Talk. And so um, I was supposed to speak there a, a year, uh, last year. Couldn't make it. But they started this thing. It's like a TED Talk. But you only can go up and talk about your failures. They have successful people only talk about their failures. Because what they found, work, working with, I won't say the companies, but larger companies, computer companies, they found that these companies did not know how to make mid-course correction after failure. They only know how to discipline people, but they couldn't deal with failure. They said, well, we got to get some successful people up here and tell them quit lying. And tell them that you fail too. Your plans will fail. You set out to do this thing? You said you're going to do this in 2020? Come on. Everybody in this room can speak on this. Like, I was going to do, I was going to finish, I was going to start, like, doing my, my national speaking, went part-time at the edge so I could do it all myself. I speak to about 60,000 people a year. And I'm supposed, I'm supposed to be going, doing all this stuff, speaking. Well, what I do take people. My plans all laid out. I'm a strategic planner. <laughs> My plans all laid out after my sabbatical. Psst. 
I just finished my sabbatical a month after that, COVID hit. Come on, hit me. After I got it all figured out, <laughs> those plans will fail you. It's a used car. What if we set our expectations like, no, these plans are good. Even if the whole big old thing, what God said. Bro, you could have had bad pizza and assume that God said. Or God said it, but he's, not, he's saying not right now. Or he's saying, I said it, but let me make some, 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 but God doesn't change. You tell me about the flood then. <laughs> the in purpose was Savior, Jesus Christ coming to this earth. That didn't change, but everything in between, our tactics will shift and change. Can you shift with it? Will you crumble? Our plans will disappoint us. And lastly, um, we can bounce back from our disappointments. That sounds like nothing. But I get paid to go and consult pastors and talk to them off the ledge. Business owners. And during COVID, I'm talking about weeks in, a big, big business. You probably buy some of that stuff. The CEO murdered himself. Because he was concerned about what would happen during the midst of this thing called COVID in the economy. He's paid out of his mind. You can bounce back from this, from disappointment, no matter what it is. Um, when I left, came back from the Detroit thing, I, I, I didn't know if I was going to continue in ministry. Most people don't know that. I was so disappointed because my plans were so well polished. I heard from the Lord so much that when those plans failed me, I didn't know if I was going to be able to bounce back. I didn't know if those people were going to believe in me again. Anybody else? You're scared, you're scared to even say, cast a vision and tell people about what you have in here because you're afraid that when it, when it has a level of failure in it, now you got to go back and you got to tell people. I'm telling you, you can bounce back. I'm telling you, you can bounce back. You better talk about Peter. Come on. This dude was, man, you can, you can bounce back. Peter was like, yo, like Jesus was like, yo, uh, upon this rock, which is not, not Peter. It was, it was, it was a, a change. It was Jesus Christ who was the only rock. He's the only center stone. So just make sure we make that clear. But he was just giving him a name, Petros. Give him the name, Peter, rock solid. Like, yo, yo, you, you my guy. This dude from then on was far, was, was clowning. <laughs> he did not, you're walking with Jesus. It's just like, oh my God, he doesn't even, nah, I don't know him. He doesn't get on my nerves. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, he does get on my nerves. That was a joke, y'all. Everybody <laughs> looked all sad, like, why'd you say that to him? Because he's a hackler, and I got to do what he does to me. <laughs> Peter went down in history, and still, we quote this man. You know, I'll say this, and I'll, I'll shut up. We quote this man. This is the same Peter. You, you understand, like, you were walking with someone for three years, Y'all together, you are you're a solid soldier. And then when someone said, hey, yo, do, do you know? So, nah, bro. I don't know who you're talking about. Do you understand that? The disciples, remember, we were given the, the great commission that to go and make disciples and all this stuff. But remember, they, they, they doubted. They, they doubted him. We talk about Thomas, but they all doubted at some level. They doubted. And they walk with the king of kings, lord of lords. Can you bounce back? We're still talking about these dudes. Peter, I mean, you know what I'm saying? We proof text these scriptures, meaning we, we typically don't read the whole context. We just take a piece of it and we make it into t-shirts kind of deal. We proof text these things, 
But man, just think about it like this. First Peter 3, 15 is like, but in your hearts, um, uh, uh, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who, everyone heard this before. That's Peter, the one that disappointed. You, you get what I'm saying? This Peter, this is the same Peter. <sighs> be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. That's that St. Peter. He bounced back. What am I saying? Disappointment is coming. Disappointment is here for many of us. But God is still on the throne. He still wants to use us in the midst of our disappointment and as others disappoint us. Is that cool? Daddy, we just thank you so much for, for you being consistent when everything else, everyone else is so stinking inconsistent. We thank you that we have a solid rock in you that we can depend on, that we can trust in, that we can lean on. In you. So Lord, I ask that you encourage us as we, as we leave from here today, God, that we can, we can trust you. We can lean on you. Because you'll never leave us nor forsake us. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Troy. You've got about 10 minutes to uh, check out some of the merch over here at the table. Please uh, bless Troy and uh, the incredible ministry. Yeah, I'm sorry, Jay, yeah. Oh, go for it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Um, oh, oh, that was deceiving. <laughs> that is deceiving. Um, my name is um, Jade Richards, and you can tell that I'm from England. I'm a um, pastor choice assistant and many other things. <laughs> um, yeah, like literally, so when um, P is talking about um, the father figure, it's such an importance, especially to me. I lost my dad on the 1st of January. So my um, year started terribly, and I don't know how I'd have got through if I didn't have another fa father figure in PE. Um, so it's important. So I just say to any um, man in here, especially if there's young people among you, or even if they're not among you, go and find them, because there's people that are really searching for father figures, and that's the one thing that's missing in their life. So even if you have to go to a community that you're not used to, you know, go fishing for somebody that you can mentor and really take under your wing because it changes people's lives. Um, so I'm going to share this poem. P told me that he was sharing about racism. I'm his assistant and he never tells me when he changes his mind. So, <laughs> so I'm going to share this poem that was written in the height of the racial tensions um, this year. But we can apply it to even what's happening now because it's about unity. It's about really being aware of what God is doing and how we can come together as the body of Christ. Um, so I'm g just going to read it. I'm going to take my time with it because I want you all to take the words in. As Christians, we need to understand that whenever there is trouble in the land, those of you who bury your heads under the sand and refuse to take a stand will eventually have blood on your hands. No longer can you say that ignorance is bliss, because let me tell you this, coming is a time when you will realize that those of you who choose to remain blind and refuse to open your eyes, deny or even try to justify the reasons behind the national outcry will have to answer why, when you are face to face with Christ. Because those of you who are called by his name have an obligation to help bring forth change, because things cannot, be the, cannot stay the same. And in order for us to move, we must weep, pray, and do. For whenever there is a time of unrest, it is a call to repent. And then, time must be spent in lament. There is a need for us to weep over the things we have seen. Because I believe, what you say and what you do are not actually real until you take the time to actually feel. Only then can, you, uh, can we actually heal. 
So let us wait. So let us wake those that are sleeping with the sound of our weeping. And then we will dedicate ourselves to seeking the King because we need him. We need to take, take heed of um, the words he is speaking. Night and day we must pray and lay prostrate to see his face so, so our faith may raise. And he will show us the way we must go. But in order for us to yield real results, we must speak. Because I believe being a Christian means that in situations like these, you no longer have a license to remain silent. We are coming to a point where we have no choice but to use our voice. The, o the other weapon we need to face this adversity is intentional diversity. If nobody around you from a different race has a seat, then you need to change the table at which you eat. For, for most importantly, we, no we need unity. We need to unite as a body of Christ if we are to win this fight. And if we are to see God's work manifest in the earth. Thank you and God bless you all. Oh, thank you guys. Thank you, Troy. Thank you, Jade, for that. And uh, now you've got five minutes to uh, go bless Troy and Jade with some cool swag over here. I'm sure they uh, would like to get rid of some of that before they leave today. So bless them. Thanks for being here today, guys. Thanks for your patience. Um, you got some people waiting outside, so uh, you have to go through them to get, it, get out of here. But God bless you next week.